Welcome. In this section, we look at the axiom of completeness. This is what makes the real numbers the real numbers. The axiom of completeness is the defining axiom of the real numbers. We'll talk about some important ideas, in particular something called the supremum and infimum. And then, it's so important, we will look at a second way of thinking about the supremum. All right, let's get to it. An initial definition for the real numbers. What is the real numbers. Okay, so here are our assumptions. First of all, the real numbers contains the rationals. That's a fair assumption. Also, the real numbers is a field. That means I can add, subtract, multiply, and divide real numbers. Uh, I, I can't divide by zero, but otherwise, the set of real numbers is closed under these operations. If I take two real numbers and I do any of these operations, the result is another real number. I also assume the ordering properties of the rationals extend to the reals. So the things you learned in high school, for example, if two numbers, a, a and b, and a is less than b, and if c is positive, then a times c is less than b times c, that kind of thing. So we imagine a number line. The real numbers has the same kind of ordering as the rationals. And now, here is the big difference the axiom of completeness. This is what I will assume about the real numbers. Every non-empty set of real numbers that is bounded above has a least upper bound. Now, it's stated in a way that looks a little bit like a theorem, perhaps, something you could prove, but it is an axiom. So it's a fundamental truth, it's a fundamental assumption that we make at the beginning of the process, and then we build the real numbers off of that. So we will assume that this is true, or define that this is true for the real numbers. Every non-empty set of real numbers that is bounded above has a least upper bound. So let's explore that idea. That's what we're doing today. We're exploring that idea. Least upper bounds, greatest lower bounds. Here's how we might imagine the set A. I think of the real number line, the x-axis perhaps, and set A is a set of real numbers. And so maybe it has some intervals, a couple intervals there, and maybe it has some discrete points, discrete points there. And those real numbers that are greater than, well, greater than or equal to all the numbers in A, those are the upper bounds of A. And all the real numbers that are less than, well, less than or equal to all the numbers in A, those are the lower bounds of A. Here we go, exactly. Here's our definition. A set A of real numbers is bounded above if there exists a number B such that A is less than or equal to B for all numbers in my set. So that's what this shows up there. Those are all the upper bounds. So B is going to live somewhere up there. That number B is called an upper bound. Now B can actually equal one of those elements of A. If, if there is some element of A that actually is the biggest element in A, then my, my little B could be an element of A, but it doesn't have to be. We say that S is the least upper bound for a set A in my set of real numbers if two things. First of all, S is an upper bound, okay, so it lives somewhere up there. But also, if B is any upper bound for A, then S is less than or equal to B. So S is the least of all upper bounds. S is the least upper bound. Now, there are some similar definitions. We can talk about being bounded below, uh, lower bound, and greatest lower bound. Those ideas are analogous to uh, bounded above, uh, upper bound, and least upper bound. Now, the greatest lower bound and the least upper bound have some special names. The least upper bound is called the supremum of A, uh, written sup A, and sometimes you might even say sup A. The greatest lower bound is the infimum of A, or the inf A. Here are some examples. Consider these uh, two sets, A and B, and take a couple seconds and see if you can identify the supremum and infimum of each of these sets. So pause and try. Go ahead right now, pause the video, take a few seconds, and then when, you, when you're ready to check your work, start the video up again. All right, let's see how you did. For set A, the supremum is 
3. And the infimum is 0. Now, notice that 3 and 0 are not elements of my set A, but that's OK. That's perfectly fine. Now, for set B, did you figure this out? The supremum of B is 1. So 1 is an upper bound for everything in B. And in fact, it's the least of the upper bounds. And I, and I know it's the least of the upper bounds because, in fact, 1 is an element of B. 1 is in B. Since I found an upper bound that's in the set, certainly that has to be the least of all the upper bounds. Because if I went any less than 1, then I'd have an element of B, 1, that was bigger than that thing. Okay. Uh, how about the infimum? In fact, the infimum in this case is 0, and 0 is not in set B. The axiom of completeness is not true in the rational numbers. So take a look at this set S. We've seen this before. This is a set of all rationals where of all, the set of all rationals R, where R squared is less than 2. We think of this on the number line. There's a negative square root of 2 and a positive square root of 2. Uh, those numbers are not included in my set S, but every number between those two things that are rational every rational number strictly between negative square root of 2 and positive square root of 2. That's what my set S is. So what is the supremum of this? Well, the supremum is the square root of 2. And look at that square root of 2. That square root of 2 is not a rational number. So even though my set S is contained in the rationals, my set S contains only rational numbers, its supremum is not rational. And so this is why we say that the axiom of completeness is not true for the rationals, although it is true, by assumption, for the real numbers. For any set of real numbers, if it has a supremum, then that supremum is also a real number. So this axiom of completeness, that is what really makes R different from Q. That's what makes the reals different from the rationals. All right, maximums and minimums. A real number, a sub 0, is a maximum of the set A if a sub 0 is an upper bound for A and if a sub 0 is actually in the set A. And there's a similar definition for a minimum. So based on that definition, here's one more chance to pause and try. Look at these questions, see what you can do, uh, try your best, and uh, when you're ready to check your work, start the video up again. Okay, give it, give it a try right now. Okay, we are back. Let's see how you did. Uh, the maximum for A is, well, none. There is no max. Uh, it, does, it has a least upper bound. The least upper bound, the supremum, is 3, but 3 is not in the set A. But A does have a min. It is 0. How about for set B? The maximum is 1. The minimum, oh, no min. And for my set S, this set of all rational numbers strictly between negative square root of 2 and positive square root of 2, the maximum, uh, it has no max. And the minimum, no min. The, uh, the supremum and the infimum of S are both elements that are not in S. Now let's use the definition of soup in a proof. We'll see how this works. Here's an example. Consider, the, consider a, uh, a number C and a set A. And we'll define, this is a little strange thing here, right? It's, this is a number plus a set. How do you add a number plus a set? And that is a new set. We might call this a shifted set. It's the set C plus A for all A in my, my numbers A. Here's how I think about this. Here's the real number line, and here's some set A. Some set has some points, maybe has an interval, I don't know, has a few more points on the right. There's my set A. And let's take all those elements in A, and we'll add 5 to them. And I get a new set, 5 plus A. And it looks like the same set as before. I mean, kind of two points there, I have a, an interval, and maybe three points above. So I start with a set A, and then I shift the set 5 units to the right. So the question is, if I know the supremum of A, sup A, what is the supremum of 5 plus A? What is the supremum of this shifted set? And this is where the claim comes in. Here we go. Claim. If the supremum of A exists, right there, that's guy, then 
the supremum of the shifted set is C plus the supremum of A. Of course, if this shifted set is bounded above, by definition, its supremum is the sup of 5 plus A, but we're claiming that, in fact, this is 5 plus the supremum of my original set A. It seems reasonable, but let's go through the actual proof using the definition of supremum to really show that this is absolutely true. Here we go. For ease of notation, let little s equal the supremum of A. Notice we have to show two things. We have to show that C plus S is an upper bound for C plus set A. And I have to show that if B is any upper bound for that shifted set, then that C plus S is less than or equal to that upper bound B. All right. So pause the video if you need to and really make sure you see why we have to show these two things are true. All right, so here's our real goal is to kind of show that this C plus S is in fact the supremum of the shifted set. All right, so for point number one here, is that thing really an upper bound? Well, I do know that A is less than or equal to S for all A in my set A. Okay, this comes from the fact that S is truly the least upper bound for set A. But now, all I have to do is just add C to both sides, plus C, plus C, and I get my new statement. C plus A is less than or equal to C plus S for all A in A. Ah, but look at that. What does that mean? This guy right here, C plus little a for all A in my set A, that is really all, I mean, those are all the elements in my shifted set, C plus big A, right? So what does that tell me? This guy on the right, C plus S, C plus S is an upper bound for all the elements of the shifted set. And that's what I needed to show in part one. All right, part two. Let's show that if B is any upper bound for the shifted set, then C plus S is less than or equal to B. So let B be an arbitrary upper bound of the shifted set. Then, since it's an upper bound, I know that C plus A has to be less than or equal to B. And that has to be true for all A because I'm representing all elements of my shifted set right there. Every element of my shifted set is less than or equal to B because B is an upper bound for that set. Okay, well, from this inequality, let's just subtract C. C from both sides. And I get A is less than or equal to B minus C. Okay, again, for all A in my set A. So what does that tell us? Now, it looks like I have an upper bound for my set A. Yeah, so this uh, B minus C really is an upper bound for set A. So S, which I know by definition is the least upper bound for my set A, S is less than or equal to that upper bound, B minus C. Ah, uh, I can see the light at the end of, end of the tunnel. We're getting there. All I have to do now is add C to both sides. C plus S is less than or equal to B as needed. <laughs> do you remember that was what we needed? So this guy right here is in fact less than or equal to uh, that upper bound I started with. All right, and that finishes the proof. Take some time to review this, uh, this proof if you need to. There's a homework problem that asks you to provide a pretty similar proof. All right, let's look at another way of seeing the supremum. Consider set A, which is 1 half, 2 thirds, 3 fourths. It starts at 1 half and then gets bigger and bigger and bigger, but those numbers always stay less than 1. But they do become arbitrarily close to 1. We see that the supremum of the set is 1 because, first of all, 1 is an upper bound. Certainly it is an upper bound, right? But also, if I think of any number less than 1, that number can't be an upper bound. If I consider 0.999, could that guy be an upper bound? No, because eventually if I go far enough out in this sequence, you know, 7 eighths, 9 tenths, uh, on and on and on, I will eventually get some number 
in A that is bigger than 0.999. So no number less than 1 is an upper bound. Well, let's take this second phrase and write it in a slightly different way. For any positive epsilon, some element in A is greater than 1 minus epsilon. So, for example, if I had taken epsilon equals 0 0.001, all right, then 1 minus epsilon, 0.999, uh, there's some number in A that's greater than this 1 minus epsilon. Here's a lemma that shows this idea as another way of looking at uh, least upper bound. Let A be a set of real numbers, and suppose that S is an upper bound for A. S is the supremum, if and only if, for every epsilon greater than zero, there's some element of A with S minus epsilon less than that element. So this statement in italics, it's not how the supremum is defined, but I'm claiming that this is an equivalent way of thinking about the supremum. S is the supremum if and only if that statement is true. All right, All right. so let's prove that this statement in italics really is equivalent to S being the supremum of A. This is an if and only if proof, so there are two things that we have to show that are equivalent. We have to show implication in two directions. I have to show that if S really is the supremum of A, then the, that other statement follows, and I have to show that if I have that complicated statement, then S truly is the supremum of A. All right, let's go. Let's assume that S is the supremum of A. If epsilon is greater than zero, then S minus epsilon is not an upper bound for A, right? S is the least of all the upper bounds. So certainly anything less than S can't be an upper bound for A. Well, what does that mean? If it's not an upper bound, then there must be some element of A that's greater than the S minus epsilon, right? If S minus epsilon is not an upper bound, then there's some element of A where S minus epsilon is less than that A. That's exactly what it means. Oh, and there it is. That's the proof right there. <laughs> How about the other direction? Assume that for every epsilon greater than zero, there is some little a in my set a with s minus epsilon less than that little a. Okay. That is, epsilon greater than zero implies s minus epsilon is not an upper bound, right? Epsilon is greater than zero and s minus epsilon is less than a, so epsilon greater than zero implies s minus epsilon is not an upper bound. Well, s must be the least of all upper bound. Because s is an upper bound, that was actually one of our underlying assumptions at the proof, at the top of the proof there. Uh, s is an upper bound, and when I subtract epsilon, I get something that is not an upper bound. So s must be the least of the upper bounds. In other words, s equals the supremum of a. And that completes the proof. And that completes our section, 1.3, the axiom of completeness, our defining axiom for what makes the real numbers the real numbers, and this important idea of the supremum.